Chapter 7. Descending. It would be vain my attempting to tell you the horror with which, even now, I recall the occurrence of that night. It was no such transitory terror as a dream leaves behind it. It seemed to deepen by time, and communicated itself to the room and the very furniture that had encompassed the apparition. I could not bear next day to be alone for a moment. I should have told Papa, but for two opposite reasons. At one time, I thought he would laugh at my story, and I could not bear it being treated as a jest. And at another, I thought he might fancy that I had been attacked by the mysterious complaint which had invaded our neighborhood. I had myself no misgivings of the kind, and as he had been rather an invalid for some time, I was afraid of alarming him. I was comfortable enough with my good-natured companions, Madame Perredon and the vivacious Mademoiselle de La Fontaine. They both perceived that I was out of spirits and nervous, and at length I told them what lay so heavy at my heart. Mademoiselle laughed, but I fancied that Madame Perredon looked anxious. By the by, said Mademoiselle, laughing, the long lime tree walk behind Carmilla's bedroom window is haunted. Nonsense, exclaimed Madame, who probably thought the theme rather inopportune. And who tells that story, my dear? Martin says that he came up twice, when the old yard gate was being repaired before sunrise, and twice saw the same female figure walking down the lime tree avenue. So he well might, as long as there are cows to milk in the river fields, said Madame. I dare say, but Martin chooses to be frightened, and never did I see fool more frightened. Who is this Martin? Where did he come from? You must not say a word about it to Carmilla, because she can see that walk from her room window, I interposed. And she is, if possible, a greater coward than I. Somehow, don't think she has that quite right. Carmilla came down rather later than usual that day. So frightened last night, she said, so soon as we were together. And I am sure I should have been seeing something dreadful if it had not been for the charm I bought from that poor little hunchback whom I called such hard names. It's me, I don't like that. I had a dream of something black coming round my bed, and I awoke in a perfect horror, and I really thought for some seconds I saw a dark figure near the chimney piece. But I felt under my pillow for the charm, and the moment my fingers touched it, the figure disappeared, and I felt quite certain, only that I had it by me, that something frightful would have made its appearance and perhaps throttled me, as it did those poor people we heard of. Well, listen to me, I began, and recounted my adventure, at the recital of which she appeared horrified. And you had the charm near you? she asked earnestly. Good actor. No, I had dropped it into the china vase in the drawing room, but I shall certainly take it with me tonight, as you have so much faith in it. Oh, she's looking out for her. That's cute. At this distance of time, I cannot tell you or even understand how I overcame my horror so effectually as to lie alone in my room that night. I remember distinctly that I pinned the charm to my pillow. I fell asleep almost immediately and slept even more soundly than usual all night. Next night, I passed as well. My sleep was delightfully deep and dreamless but I wakened with a sense of lassitude and melancholy, which, however, did not exceed a degree that was almost luxurious. Well, I told you so, said Carmilla when I described my quiet sleep. I had such delightful sleep myself last night. I pinned the charm to the breast of my nightdress. It was too far away the night before. I am quite sure it was all fancy except the dreams. I used to think that evil spirits made dreams, but our doctor told me that it was no such thing, only a fever passing by, or some other malady, as they often do, he said, knocks at the door and not being able to get in, passes on with that alarm. And what do you think the charm is, said I? It has been fumigated or immersed in some drug, as in an antidote against the malaria, she answered. That it acts only on the body? Certainly. You don't suppose that evil spirits are frightened by bits of ribbon or the perfumes of a druggist's shop? No, these complaints wandering in the air begin by trying the nerves and so infect the brain, but before they can seize upon you, the antidote repels them. That, I am sure, is what the charm has done for us. It's nothing magical. It is simply natural. I should have been happier if I could have quite agreed with Carmilla, but I did my best and the impression was a little losing its force. For some nights I slept profoundly, but still, early every morning, I felt the same lassitude and a languor weighed upon me all day. I felt myself a changed girl. A strange melancholy was stealing over me, a melancholy that I would not have interrupted. Dim thoughts of death began to open, and an idea that I was slowly sinking took gentle and somehow not unwelcome possession of me. It was sad, the tone of my mind, which this induced was also sweet. Whatever it might be, my soul acquiesced in it. I would not admit that I was ill. I would not consent to tell my papa or to have the doctor sent for me. Carmilla became more devoted to me than ever, and her strange paroxysms, it's an everyday word, of languid adoration more frequent. 
She used to gloat on me with increasing ardor the more my strength and spirit waned. This always shocked me like a momentary glare of insanity. Without knowing it, I was now in a pretty advanced stage of the strangest illness under which mortal ever suffered. There was an unaccountable fascination in its earlier symptoms that more than reconciled me to the incapacitating effect of that strain stage of the malady. This fascination increased for a time until it reached a certain point when gradually a sense of the horrible mingled itself with it, deepening, as you shall hear, until it discolored and perverted the whole state of my life. The first change I experienced was rather agreeable. It was very near the turning point from which began the descent of Avernus. Certain vague and strange sensations visited me in my sleep. The prevailing one was of that pleasant, peculiar, cold thrill which we feel in bathing when we move against the current of a river. This was soon accompanied by dreams that seemed interminable and were so vague that I could never recollect their scenery and persons or any one connected portion of their action, but they left an awful impression and a sense of exhaustion, as if I had passed through a long period of great mental exertion and, and danger. It's kind of how I feel reading this novella. After all these dreams, there remained on waking a remembrance of having been in a place very nearly dark and of having spoken to people whom I could not see and especially of one clear voice of a female's very deep that spoke of it at a distance, slowly and producing always the same sensation of indiscernible solemnity and fear. Sometimes there came a sensation as if a hand was drawn softly along my cheek and neck. Sometimes it was as if warm lips kissed me and longer and longer and more lovingly as they reached my throat. But there the caress fixed itself. My heart beat faster. My breathing rose and fell rapidly and full drawn. A sobbing that rose into a sense of strangulation supervened and turned into a dreadful convulsion in which my senses left me and I became unconscious. Whew. It was now three weeks since the commencement of this unaccountable state. My sufferings had, during the last week, told upon my appearance. I had grown pale, my eyes were dilated and darkened underneath, and the languor which I had felt long began to display itself in my countenance. My father asked me often whether I was ill, but, with an obstinacy which now seems to me unaccountable, I persisted in ensuring him that I was quite well. In a sense, this was true. I had no pain. I could complain of no bodily derangement. My complaint seemed to be one of the imagination or the nerves and, horrible as my sufferings were, I kept them with a morbid reserve very nearly to myself. It could not be that terrible complaint, which the peasants called the au pair, for I had now been suffering for three weeks and they were seldom ill for much more than three days when death put an end to their miseries. Carmilla complained of dreams and feverish sensations, but by no means of so alarming a kind as mine. I say that mine were extremely alarming. Had I been capable of comprehending my condition, I would have invoked aid and advice on my knees. The narcotic of an unsuspected influence was acting upon me, and my perceptions were benumbed. I am going to tell you now of a dream that led immediately to an odd discovery. One night, instead of the voice I was accustomed to hear in the dark, I heard one, sweet and tender, at the same time terrible, which said, Your mother warns you to beware of the assassin. At the same time, a light unexpectedly sprang up and I saw Carmilla standing near the foot of my bed in her white nightdress, bathed from her chin to her feet in one great stain of blood. I wakened with a shriek, possessed with the one idea that Carmilla was being murdered. I remember springing from my bed and my next recollection is that of standing on the lobby crying for help. Madame and Mademoiselle came scurrying out of their rooms in alarm. A lamp burned always on the lobby and seeing me, they soon learned the cause of my terror. I insisted on knocking at Carmilla's door. Our knocking was unanswered. It soon became a pounding and an uproar. We shrieked her name, but all was vain. We all grew frightened for the door was locked. We hurried back in panic to my room. There we rang the bell long and furiously. If my father's room had been at the side of the house, we would have called him up at once to our aid. But alas, he was quite out of hearing and to reach him involved an exertion for which none of us had had courage. Servants, however, soon came running up the stairs. I had got on my dressing gown and slippers meanwhile, and my companions were already similarly furnished. Recognizing the voices of the servants on the lobby, we sailed out together and having renewed as fruitlessly our summons at Carmilla's door, I ordered the men to force the lock. They did so and we stood holding our lights aloft in the doorway and so stared into her room. We called her by her name, but there was still no reply. We looked around the room. 
everything was undisturbed. It was exactly in the state in which I had left it on the bidding of her good night. But Carmilla was gone. Where did she go? Tune in again to find out.